It's the year of the garden, and where better to celebrate than Victoria, BC, the city of gardens. Recorded on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen and Wasanich nations, this series examines local history, culture, and ecology over a nice cup of tea. So put the kettle on and join us. Welcome to Tea and Gardens. The Butchart Gardens is a national historic site and the number one tourist destination in Greater Victoria. We've come to learn about these world famous gardens as well as the families that have kept them in bloom for more than a hundred years. So let's go. Mr. Butchart was a pioneer in the cement industry and back in the early 1900s, uh, he relocated out this way and uh, this site was actually a very great area for limestone and, and for the possibility of producing cement. So we were actually uh, halfway down into the quarry, which you can imagine back in the early 1900s was an open pit mine. So Mr. Butchart came out, um, they developed a cement plant here, so a lot, they produced cement here for quite a number of years. And then eventually, like all mines, it got exhausted. Uh, the Butcharts were living on the property and uh, Mrs. Butchart, being like any horticulturalist, she started landscaping around her house in essence. And Mrs. Butchart saw the, the prospects and the promise of it. And she started trucking soil back in with horse and cart uh, from the local farms and just started developing all these flower beds. And the second garden is, has sort of been main, our main feature garden, like you, when you see historic shots of the gardens all around. Uh, the second garden is always prominently featured as our main display garden. May I ask what kind of plants you have in this area? Uh, well, we've just, um, any uh, borders that you see that have flowers in them, we transition two to three to four times a year. So we've just come out of our spring season. So we've had, we had 300,000 bulbs for our spring display and we're transitioning to our summer display. So a lot of uh, your traditional summer annuals like begonias, marigolds, uh, geraniums, New Guinea imp impatiens, things like that. Uh, just in a lot more quantity and quality. Uh, than you would see in a normal home, so it's uh, something that kind of sets us apart. I've been the director of horticulture for coming up on three years now, and uh, I've been a part of the gardens. Uh, I'm entering my 48th year here, being employed at the gardens. 48th year? 48th year, yes. That's very impressive. Yeah, Do you yeah. get like a special medal or something when you hit 50? We do, yeah. We actually honor long-term staff and uh, it seems like a lot, but we were actually honoring next year a 60-year employee who was a cousin of mine who is, was our greenhouse manager and uh, she is our greenhouse consultant now. So, we, and we just retired, someone just retired who was another 60-year employee. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, we have a long history here. Yeah, yeah, I think it speaks very highly of a place that you have people who stay around for that long. It is, yeah. It's a great company to work for. They, uh, we are very, a very tight group, very family-oriented in essence. and. Uh, well, my father worked here for years and he was a head gardener when he retired and my folks immigrated here from Portugal and Mr. Ross, uh, the grandson of the butcharts who took over the company, basically built us to what we are today to make us into a big display garden. Uh, he hired my dad back in the early 50s and um, my parents lived in the company house and I was actually living in the company house until I was four years old. And then when I was in school, my dad was, uh, had been working here and he thought I needed some work. So he dragged me in here and I started working here when I was 14 years old. And, uh, and basically we apprentice people on the job. So I, I've trained on the job. I've worked through many different areas and aspects of the gardens. Uh, through my life, I've been very fortunate to, to be able to change sort of roles. I've probably changed roles about four or five times through my career here. And it's been a very rewarding experience. So you have a pretty thorough understanding of this place. I do, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a part of me. And you can't ask for a better spot. I always think of people who say they go into work and they go into an office and, and I come into one of the most beautiful offices in the world to work every day. And I just feel so, so grateful, especially through these last couple of years, which have been a little tough, but to be able to come over this, the rise and then look over the garden and see the beauty that we create and the inspiration that we give to gardeners and people around the world, I think is something very unique. Victoria is known as the City of Gardens, yeah. and in this city, Butchart is certainly the most well-known of the gardens. Yeah. Why would you say this garden is so important to Victorians? Um, I think 
uh, tourism and ecotourism is becoming so popular. And gardens are always, we've always provided this um, a destination spot. I think and for the city of Victoria, uh, visitors or, or tourists like to have destination spots to go to. And I know when I travel around the world, I say I'm from Victoria, and most people ask me, do you know the gardens there? So we are so, our name is, his, has become synonymous with Victoria. And I think it's, it's, we really appreciate the fact that we can provide this for the people of Victoria, because I think we do help for ourselves, because we are still very independent. We are privately owned still, we're still in the family. My great granddaughter of the Butcharts still owns and manages uh, the business, our company, and uh, her father, um, Mr. Ian Ross, who ran us for quite a number of years. Or Mr. Ross was always famous for wanting as much color as possible to, to wow people. He always loved that wow factor of the uh, massive plantings of color. So that's something we've always tried to maintain. And we maintain a lot of Mrs. Butchart. Mrs. Butchart was a pioneer in sourcing plant material around the world. And we've tried to maintain a lot of her touches in the gardens. So where are we right now? Um, we were in a, a newer area to the gardens. Uh, we we're approaching the um, our rose carousel, and this is kind of an area that we have a little bit of fun with. It's themed more around children and a fun, airy bed, so we're a little bit out of our normal element of planting. Um, so we actually have a little bit, a lot of fun in this area. You notice that uh, the, the, a lot of the plant material is very airy. Uh, we have some uh, alocasias, which are very unique, uh, very different. Um, we do different plants that have different movements in the, in the bit of a breeze. Uh, we have the big elephant ear alocasias, uh, like sort of the African mass type of alocasias, and then and very colorful beds and, and, and different from our normal plants, the, sort of the typical begonias and marigolds you would see in a lot of our other display beds. Could you speak to how butchart changes and adapts with the seasons? Yeah, so each, each season we try and um, maximize our color throughout our whole year because we have visitors coming from all over. And throughout the whole the whole year, we're trying to make this a year-round operation. So we plant uh, for our spring displays. We will plant a lot of early bulbs like uh, crocus and snowdrops and things, and transition to daffodils, tulips. And then once those are all finished, we transition to our summer planting. So we do all of our summer annuals that we grow on site uh, to give us color throughout the summer. And as we go into the fall, then we will plant chrysanthemums and other fall plant material, and then we rely on our trees. Our trees will be changing color in the fall, so that gives us depth of color throughout the whole garden. And then back in the Christmas time, then we would change again, and we would become a nighttime garden. We light the whole gardens for Christmas, so we do a, an amazing display at Christmas. So we try and have something of interest throughout the whole year for visitors. So could you please speak to how you approach sustainability and what environmental initiatives you have? Yeah, I think that's something I'm very proud of that we've we've done here at the gardens. As, as we, visitors look around the garden and see our green lawns and our lush plants, they think we must be pumping things full of all kinds of chemicals. But we've really had a big transition in the last number of years going to uh, thinking about sustainability, thinking about the environment, going, we've gone uh, mostly to organic fertilizers in a lot of our flower beds now. We also have a implemented a, a quite extensive IPM program, which integrated pest management. So it kind of looks at the holistic growth of plants in an overall sense. So we used to try and force plants to grow in an area they didn't want to. So now it's more of the right plant in the right place. Look at your soil conditions, look at how things get taken up. And we use a lot of natural predators. So we've, we've reduced our, our pesticide use substant, like it's almost non-existent now. So what we would use in the gardens. Like in the old chemical days, you would try and wipe out a pest. And you would also kill a lot of beneficials. So now we actually monitor the plants, we find the, the pest that's causing us the problems, we find a natural predator that will only go after that little bug and control it. So we're not wiping out a pest, we're just managing it. Uh, all the material you see after we pull plant material and everything, we compost it all. We haven't purchased soil in, in 20 years. So all of, our, all of our composted plants, we recycle. We have a huge uh, recycling operation. Any brush material, we grind it back up, we add it to our compost, uh, we sterilize it using steam um, to make sure that uh, to kill any, any pathogens. So we've, we've really tried to look after everything that we do uh, for the environment and for our own little niche in the world. Make it more of a closed loop. It is, yeah, and we're very, uh, we have our own water sources on the property. We try and recycle water wherever we can, like we will use water for our uh, heat pumps or for our heating buildings, and then that gets recirculated back into our irrigation water. We'll collect water 
off our parking lots and uh, store it in, in ponds and use that whenever possible. So we really are thinking about everything that we're, that, what we're doing around in our area and our little bit can help so much. I love that. Yeah. yeah. That's very cool. I noticed some tropical plants here behind you. I'm yeah. wondering how they survive the winter. Yes, people might think, yes, we are. We've, we are the banana belt of Canada. We like to joke about that you are quite warm, but uh, these plants are on the tropical side and they would not survive our winters. We do get the odd snowfall. We do get cold weather. So a lot of this plant material that's out here, we have protected greenhouses. So we have greenhouses where we will do our production plants. We also have a number of them that are strictly where a lot of this plant material will put it back in the greenhouses, protect it for the winter. And when the time's right each, each season, we bring it back out and put it on display. And that way it gives us a lot more creativity and a lot more, way more flexibility to what we can actually produce and show people in our garden. And it's very unique to be able to show them in a city like Victoria, this type of material. We can see this very interesting structure behind you. Could you yeah. please tell us about it? Well, it's very, actually, it's a, a, a proud piece of our garden now. Um, our, our current owner is a great granddaughter of the Butch Arts. One of her big passions was carousels. And so she really wanted to put her mark on, her, on the gardens. Her father had his things in the garden. Her grandmother had her things. And uh, so she contacted this company and wanted to make her own carousel. And we actually had all the figures are hand carved, wooden figures. Uh, she was instrumental in, the, in designing and the paint for the animals and which animals were chosen. It's more like a menagerie of, of animals. And it's all things that might tie into our history here, her family history or things to our visitors so it's it's very unique and we actually did a green living roof on it so just to try and add to uh, to our garden so we've added a garden to the roof space so we're not we didn't impact any of the environmental thing we actually have kept it a part of the garden one of the things you notice on the top of the building is again like we talked about our children's area where we have a bit of fun we do lots of topiary figures so we've been acquiring figures from all around we have and we do different displays and you can see them on the top of the roof where we've been displaying these topiary figures hidden throughout the gardens for children to find. So it's kind of a fun thing for kids to do. And this, the carousel has really helped promote, I think, promote gardening and children. Because we've got to get that next generation wanting to be involved in gardening, wanting to enjoy it and wanting to, to appreciate gardens. We were very charmed by the Rose Carousel. The menagerie of animals includes bears, ostriches, an orca, and the butchart family dogs, Winston and Bella. It's also the only carousel on Vancouver Island, so it truly is a unique piece of art. The carousel isn't the only striking art in this area. Let's get back to Carlos to hear about the totem poles that stand nearby. One of the uh, very um, neat projects that we were involved with for our 100 year anniversary of the gardens, and respecting the lands that we were on, we contracted out to a couple of local carvers and we actually set them up on, the, on site and through one whole, that whole summer of 2004, they carved these beautiful totem poles for the garden. So they were on site carving the totem poles and we had the big ceremony to actually install them. So I think it's a way to honor our, the local heritage and uh, we have this, these beautiful pieces of art that we can display in our garden. So where are we now? Uh, we were just in front of our begonia bower. So this, back in the day, was Mr. Butchart. Mr. Butchart was a, a bird fan, a bird fanatic. So this used to be his aviary. And uh, so he, he had all kinds of different uh, rare birds. Mrs. Butchart was the plant person, Mr. Butchart loved his, his birds and then after after the time we've um, developed this into a beautiful hanging garden so we display begonias and fuchsias in this area there seems to be a very wide variety of of flowers here right now yeah the one nice thing about uh, again like begonias people say begonias might be a, a bedding plant a very basic bedding plant but when you look at these tuberous varieties there are hundreds of varieties different varieties of begonias and there are hundreds of lots of different varieties of fuchsias so each one has its unique characteristics of the flower and they might be crossbred so that you get the best of this flower with the best of that flower so you get some really beautiful combinations and, and the fuchsias are, are a flower if you look at them there's so many different combinations of colors and and styles and sizes of the blooms so it's, it's such a beautiful way to display color so it's like a more like a, a vertical garden rather than just being a, a flat plain garden. 
Do you incorporate native plants into these gardens? Actually, we do uh, try and uh, incorporate as much native plant material as we can. Uh, we are a display garden, so we are known for our color and our uh, mass plantings of different annuals. But anywhere that we can naturalize areas, we do try and... And, and you can actually see we're actually surrounded by native plant material. When you look at the, the Douglas firs, our uh, native maple trees, all kinds of different material that, that borders our gardens is all, very, is all native plant material. And I just saw a bee buzzing behind you. Do you have bees here at all? or We don't keep bees personally, but uh, there are some local bee keepers in, in the area. So they, they get the benefit of using our garden for, for their products. So I think they love being close to us and situated near us. So we provide a lot of the honey for the local, for the local area. You're part of the wider bee ecosystem. We are, yes. One of the things I kind of love about the gardens is when you look around right now, um, again, we are known for display beds, and but when you look at certain times of the year, like right now, there's the depth of the trees. We've just come out of our spring season, which is one of my favorite times of the year. We do so many different types of daffodils and tulips, and it's a gorgeous time. Then we transition to our summer, which I just love the different colors. But uh, we even have like our Japanese garden, which we didn't touch on today. It's the one garden where we don't do annual plantings, but it provides its own beauty. It's more of a tranquil garden for visitors to experience and it and it will provide a color through the azaleas and rhododendrons in the spring like right now that's sort of helping us in our transition period in the fall the, the colors down there it just it's like it glows some days in the fall so there's beauty in every part of the garden and uh, and you just take your time to just wander and enjoy and and uh, and enjoy the garden I just think it's so especially in these times after we, what we've come through I think it's so appreciated by everybody to go and enjoy a garden, enjoy the fragrances again. And the bees and the birds will want to join the garden. We then headed to the former Butchart residence, now the dining room, to meet chef Travis Hansen. I've been working on this property for the last 29 years, which has been amazing. It's, uh, I've been spoiled every day I come to work uh, to be surrounded by the beautiful plants and location. This room that we're in right now is really beautiful. Could you tell us a bit about the history of it? Well, this was, uh, so we, we, it's affectionately known as the conservatory, or we call it the conservatory. And this was the, the first room that was offered for tea. Um, it's just such a, a beautiful way to bring the light in in the gardens. You feel like you're inside of a greenhouse, which is really nice. So this is, it's a pretty special room. I think a lot of people will ask to be sat in this room. It's just, it's a very unique um, space compared to some of the other properties or other spaces in the property here. And this was the, the residence of the Butchart family, is that This correct? was, yeah. This, this building was their original residence. Um, and then over, uh, you know, through the last 120 years has been expanded and grown. And, and it's got multiple different rooms, which is neat. Lots of characters. So depending, you know, people can come three and four and five times and sit in different rooms and, and almost have a different experience, even though you're having the same tea or the same products. It just has a different feel. And this one's really fun and light and lively. Could you please describe the other rooms? Ooh. Some of the other um, spaces we have available in the dining room is our white room, which was their formal dining room. We also have a room called the breakfast room, which is really neat, really soft colors. It looks over the Italian gardens. Another room we have available is the tango room, and we'll use that quite often in the wintertime. It's got a really homey feel, rich woodwork, fireplace, lots of history. So again, you're able to see, have multiple different experiences within the same building, which is nice. And how long has there been tea service here at Butchart Gardens? Uh, so I guess in, informally it started in the early 50s with uh, Mrs. Ross. She would offer up strawberry shortcakes and crumpets, um, little tea sandwiches, and she was actually doing it in this room here, which is our conservatory. So it's, it's got about a 70, a 70 year lineage to it. And, and over the years it's expanded into different rooms and different offerings. But I'd say, yeah, that, that culture here personally has been, you know, we're, we're over 70 years of service right now. Why do you think it is that Victoria responds so well to, like, afternoon tea? <laughs> uh, I, I guess I've found it's, just, it's very fitting. It's very fitting with the, the old British colonial culture and, and the buildings and the history and the architecture. And just I think the gardens is, is very conducive to, um, to sitting. It's a slower pace that we don't see too often anymore. Everything else is so busy, whereas... I think coming here for tea, we want it to be a, an experience of sitting with your family, sharing, talking, slowing the pace down, and, and the gardens is great for that. Um, 
and it's just nice to come. We find when people come here, they are relaxed. They they want to sit. They want to share. They want to engage with their their company. So that's something we want to encourage in this environment. Also, is calm and, and relaxed and, and comfortable. Do you have a house blend of tea? We do. Yeah, we uh, we're fortunate to to work with some great suppliers. So we've come up with with our own tea blends. Um, really popular was years ago for the anniversary of the property, we came up with a 100 year anniversary blend and that's been our, our most popular tea blend. And also being aware now of people wanting decaffeinated products. So we have herbal teas, um, mint tea, lemongrass, um, green tea and such. What's in the 100 year blend? It was a blend that we, um, we created to get to celebrate the 100 year anniversary. So in 2004, was uh, was the year so it's a blend of black Chinese gunpowder tea as well as green tea um, and we find it has a nice kind of smoky earthiness to it which actually goes really well with the tea it's not super floral um, which we have other ones but it, it, it's a unique tea that is it's by far our most popular um, loose leaf tea for our customers and the name gunpowder tea that comes from the aesthetics no it's not actual gunpowder it's not right? actual gunpowder we, we do get asked that question but no it's the uh, the tea leaves are they're they're formed into little balls almost. So they look very much like a like a little pellet or a little uh, a little BB, like a little gunpowder um, specimen there. So when people come here for afternoon tea, uh, what do they get? Could you walk us through the tower? Absolutely. We we start out. It, it sometimes may uh, it's a little unique, but we'll start out with an English trifle, so a traditional English trifle. So. Um, sponge cake, seasonal fruit compote, a diplomat cream on top. So they, they start out with that. Then every guest gets their choice of a loose leaf tea. So one of our um, individually crafted teas. So that's that's specific to the customer. And then we're working down from the tiers. We'll do our house made scone, which is a ginger scone, which is an old family recipe. Actually, one of the recipes from Mrs. Butchert. So that's been her signature scone for as long as uh, as long as we've been in existence here. Um, then there's a Devon cream and a house made jam, so that will sometimes change, but strawberry or one of our local preserves. Then we go into a plate of sandwiches. Um, so you, the finger sandwiches was always, you know, a chicken. So this year we're doing um, smoked alba pork tuna. We're also doing local pork from Bearman's Farms, which is down by Island View Beach. Chicken from the Couch and Valley, as well as some vegetarian options. So again, just we really want to showcase seasonality, what's local, what's fresh, and what, what ties into um, what we want our tea to be. So does, your, does that tea menu change throughout the year? We do. We offer, um, we'll do high tea in the wintertime, so it's a little more substantial, a little more focused on um, savory and warmer items there. Um, and then we'll do a springtime tea. We are doing fun teas now at Christmas to celebrate Christmas, also Mother's Day. So... We're, we're, we're coming up with about four or five different tea menus. We're really fortunate also that all of our products are made in-house. So we have a separate pastry department. So all of um, all the sweets, all of the, the jams, the compotes, the sandwiches, everything is made in-house. We do not purchase anything. So we're really fortunate to have such a great team who's been here for, for so long and, and, and uh, we know what our customer is looking for. How do you incorporate or do you incorporate the gardens into the menus? I think we, we try as much as possible. Um, obviously, there's a strong focus on the flowers here, so we'll do infusions into some of our vinegars and our honeys. We're really fortunate on property to have a herb garden and, and edible flower garden. So it's something that's behind the scenes. It's not open to public, but it's something we're able to utilize all the time. So you'll see our chefs are going out and we're collecting mint and basil and tarragon oregano, as well as all the edible flowers. So we'll have pansies, um, bellas, Flowering sage, flowering rosemary, and we'll use those into uh, into a lot of the products on the different menus. How do you feel coming to work in this beautiful space? <laughs> I feel pretty blessed every day to show up here. I um, I was born and raised five kilometers up the road, um, and now I live about four kilometers down the road. So yeah, pretty much every day showing up. It's just it's a spectacular property. It changes through the year also, so it's uh, it's kind of different. Every, every year you show up, you're seeing something different, and you're watching the gardens grow as well as, as seeing the property change. And it, it's, it's neat to see the, the change of seasons here. It, it's something you can come back every couple months, and, and it's, it's going to be a different experience or a different, uh, a different feel to the property. But, uh, yeah, I'm pretty, uh, pretty lucky to, uh, 
to be working here every day. Thank you very much to Carlos Moniz, Travis Hansen, and everyone working behind the scenes at Butchart Gardens. Thank you for watching Tea and Gardens. This is our final episode. But if you want to learn more, check out our podcast. You can also find us on social media at Tea and Gardens YYJ. Cheers and happy gardening.